Okay, so I'm Robert, I'm from Oxford, and today I'm going to be talking to you about using tungsten in fusion reactors, kind of what we know, how we're going to use it, and what science still needs to be done to get it there. Um, so first I'll introduce the background for those less familiar with the idea of nuclear fusion, using it for energy purposes. Um, then we'll talk about what the aim of this literature review was, what I was trying to achieve, what I was trying to find out, uh, before talking about what I did find out, and then talking a little bit about what I want to do next. So, the fusion materials challenge. Tungsten uh, fusion is going to be the next, uh, is, has the potential to be a very large source of energy. It's very low carbon, clean, and you can have it on such a small footprint that you can produce vast amounts of energy at relatively low cost. Um, historically, it's been very much a physics challenge. The idea of trying to keep this plasma confined within a magnetic field has been a very difficult physics challenge, but they're getting there. JET in Oxfordshire has shown that fusion can be achi achieved, and the next machine, ITER, will go on and demonstrate that you can sustain that for several minutes at a time. Um, this is the fusion reaction we're trying to achieve by combining deuterium and tritium to produce helium and a lot of energy. One also critical thing in there is that neutron. That neutron comes out with 80% of the energy and causes extensive damage to all the wall around your reactor. On the right, we have a diagram of jet, and down here is the bit I'm interested in. That's your tungsten diverter. There, you can see almost exclusively the tungsten diverter. That is where the plasma comes into contact with the wall, and obviously it gets very hot. Um, the reason we do that is to try and extract the helium ash from this reaction. To keep the reaction going, you want a good hydrogen plasma, too much helium in there, and your reaction dies. And so we extract the helium by bringing it into contact with the diverter. The result of that is you have an extremely high heat flux. Um, the plasma is at several million Kelvin, and you bring it into contact with that area, and then it's got to cool down to a few Kelvin for the superconducting magnets not far outside this. Um, in addition, you've got those extremely high energy neutrons. They're going to cause a lot of damage. I'll talk about that more later. Finally, you've got this heat, hydrogen and helium flux. This is the critical thing that has led to tungsten being chosen. Um, they tested carbon diverters, which are also good for thermal conductivity and could take the, uh, had sufficient mechanical properties. But the critical thing was this iron flux causes erosion. And you've got to try and minimise that if you're going to try and get 5 to 20 years out of this diverter. This is a molecular dynamics simulation of what happens when the neutron encounters your material. This is where the literature review is going to be focused, and I'll be talking about this more later. But basically, you've got a neutron comes in here, interacts with an atom, this then knocks on many others, causing hundreds of vacancies and interstitials, shown in red and blue here, to appear. And the neutron then fly off and will go many hundreds of atoms more before it interacts again, but it leaves behind this cloud of vacancies and interstitials. They'll interact, a lot of them will recombine, um, but some will, won't, and they tend to agglomerate with similar d defects. As a result, you get loops made out of either interstitials or vacancies, um, and then this leads to void for can lead to void formation as well. Um, all of these defects then uh, block dislocations, um, stop them being able to flow freely, and cause hardening of the material, which is what I'll be focusing on today. Um, I'll also be using the DPA a lot, which I'm not sure of all of you can be familiar with, that's the idea of a displacement per atom. At one DPA, the neutron has caused every atom in that, on average, to have been displaced once. Most of them have recombined, and so the atoms aren't all in different places, but you get do is a very large level of damage. The other things neutron do, as well as this direct displacement damage, is transmutation. The tungsten atom can absorb a neutron. This goes to terenium, which is one heavier than tungsten, with some beta decay in there. Um, after five years in a fusion reactor, we're looking at beasts being somewhere about the composition of the orange arrow there. Um, however, that should be stable. The phase diagram tells you that's BCC. But actually, we see both sigma phase forming and the chi phase forming, which are way beyond the equilibrium position. That's because of this radiation damage takes you far away from equilibrium, this excess of defects and things like that result in you having a very kind of non-equilibrium state. So, briefly the techniques that I'll be talking about. 
We use TEM to analyze. You can see precipitates, you can take the diffraction pattern, a lot of useful tools there. Um, in a, more recently, we've also used atom probe tomography. This is very useful for detecting, detect, de detecting these clusters before they become precipitates. So here, you've got a slight clustering of rhesium at the bottom right at 33 dPa. There, it wouldn't show up necessarily in your TEM. The diffraction pattern wouldn't have those bright extra spots on them. But you can just start to see that there's definitely some migration of rhesium away from an equilibrium position. Um, in addition to understanding the um, microstructural changes, we want to know what effect that has on properties. Historically, it's mostly been micro-hardness testing that has obvious limitations. You just indent the material, see how big your indent is. That only tells you very little about material. Um, using instrumented indentation, this is the Oliver and Far to calculate the stiffness. That tells you a bit more about what changes are going on. And then adding in micromechanics, testing small mechanical test samples, um, you can find out things like yield strength and fra even fracture properties, as I've shown there on the right. So, my aims today. What, what do we know about tungsten? How do we, what do we know about how it's going to change once you put it in that fusion environment? Can we explain what happens to the mechanical properties based upon the changes we observe in the microstructure? What can we do to extrapolate kind of very limited testing conditions, whether that be from fission reactors or ion irradiation? Can we then extrapolate, use those results to understand what's going to happen in a fusion reactor where you're going to see tens of dPa rather than kind of signal figures DPA, which we're used to from a fission environment. Also, what's the next step? What don't we know? How do we find that out? So, this is looking at some studies that were carried out in Japan, um, looking mainly at TEM. Um, this was done to kind of characterize the microstructural changes. So on the left, you can see that's chi phase. They identified that as the chi phase precipitates forming as a result of transmutation and the irradiation damage. And then on the right, you've also got voids. These kind of are where you've got vacancies agglomerating into bigger empty spaces. Um, so they did a whole bunch of tungsten with rhenium and osmium to try and simulate this transmutation condition. And they did it at fairly fusion relevant temperatures you're looking at that diverter operating close to 800 degrees C or over 1,000 Kelvin. Um, one thing they did show was that once they went up to, say, something close to 25% rhenium, which represents a very long time in a fusion reactor, is that you see less void formation um, due to the rhenium and osmium that was present in their alloys. In terms of mechanical properties, the list is very limited. They did some vicus hardness testing um, but it wasn't particularly well done. So one of the big things is they didn't. They assumed no transmutation. They had a citation for this and quoted this, but kind of never examined that further. And if you look at this graph on the right, you can see that for zero to ten percent rhenium, at, towards the right hand side, you still get the same level of hardening. You take that up to twenty six percent rhenium, and you see significantly more hardening. Now you're seeing precipitates in all of those three below, but the difference, they, they kind of assumed that zero was still close to zero percent, whereas I don't think that's true. Um, they didn't calculate it. Once they did calculate it, they showed it was 10 percent, but then they didn't measure it. It wouldn't have been very difficult to stick this in an SEM, take some spectroscopy data and show what the level was. Uh, but one thing is you do clearly see hardening due to these precipitates forming. Oh, so that's just to highlight the difference there. Um, so here is using ion irradiation. We don't have the time or the money to put tungsten in neutron re reactors, uh, fission reactors for long enough to really get to the high levels of DPA you're going to see in a fusion environment. So the best thing we can do to try and simulate that is by firing tungsten ions in. These cause damage much quicker, but in a fairly similar fashion, that when the neutron hits one atom, it kind of causes instant cascade. You can imagine a tungsten atom coming in, it's going to cause a similar cascade uh, with a similar amount of energy. Um, here are the changes in hardness. This is pure tungsten, and you get a very slight hardening with 
um, using iron irradiation. One key thing is it doesn't seem to very strongly depend on dose. This is a log scale and you're getting a steady but low increase in hardness. Add in that rhenium and you can see you get suddenly a big jump in the hardening level once you go above about 10 dPa. Um, this was done with atom probe in tandem and that's the point where you start to see this clustering. This is starting to show that the very much the dominant effect in tungsten is due to precipitate formation. Your kind of loops and void formation don't seem to have, be having that significant effect. One other valuable thing we've learned from um, ion irradiation is some very good TEM studies. These have identified and characterized the very small loops that are forming. This is critical for feeding into things like molecular dynamics models so that we can understand kind of below the scale we can see. Um, here they showed that you get 111 and 100 loops. This was significant because 100 loops were not predicted to exist. According to the theory beforehand, the elastic anisotropy should have meant that you didn't get any of these loops, but they're observed, and then only later could MD models be scaled back to match that prediction, that result. So that kind of suggests that the modeling is not where it needs to be yet. You kind of hear the idea of computer modeling as a predictive tool. Well, it's yet to make a very significant prediction in this case, certainly. So then, comparing ions and neutrons. If we want to use ions to get to those very high doses, does that work? The clue here is probably not. Um, here, the neutron has caused much higher hardening, much faster in pure tungsten. However, again, I'll bring that as this point that they didn't consider transmutation. And once you go across to when they started with tungsten and 5% rhenium, you get a closer match. Um, there is a big gap. That's about 100 times the level of DPA before you get the same hardening effect. So you can kind of understand what's going on there. So earlier on in the iron, in the iron irradiation, they didn't see the clustering. That only came above 10 dPa. Whereas in the neutron, you're seeing that level of uh, precipitate formation much sooner on. My, so there's possible causes for this. Temperatures were fairly similar. There is a very big difference in dose rate. Your ion irradiation takes about a day. Your neutron irradiation takes several years to get, well, maybe a year to get a DPA. So there, you've obviously got a very different time scale for things like precipitate formation to happen, for the kind of equi like a state to evolve. And this may prove to be a critical factor that we have to try and understand going forwards if we're going to use ion irradiation as a predictive tool. So, the conclusions from the literature. It seems that precipitate formation is going to be the dominant hardening mechanism in tungsten. There's been a lot of talk about void formation and loop formation, but it seem, really seems that the hardening only takes off once you get those precipitates and you are always going to get those precipitates. They happen at low dose under neutron irradiation. The kind of impact of this had been, has been underestimated somewhat because the early papers looking at hardening in tungsten underestimated the transmutation. They predicted the what they didn't take it into account, and so they failed to account for precipitate formation. Um, there's large differences between the ions and the neutrons. If we're going to use a particular tool, we have to try and bring that closer, try and understand why those differences exist. Uh, so we want to bring more consistent studies to that. I'll talk about more about that in just a second. And finally, the TEM loop analysis. It's been very good for feeding into small scale models, but it's only been done on ion irradiation. Is it actually true that in neutron irradiation you get the same loops forming, or are we missing something very critical at that scale? So a little bit about the future work. So we're going to carry out studies using iron and neutron irradiated. Neutron irradiators are only going to be up to about a DPA again, but we're going to compare that to very similar iron irradiated material. We're also going to critically match the end composition from the neutron sample to understand what the rhenium is doing there and put it into, so say we've got 2% rhenium that we can measure at the end of the neutron radiation, we'll put that into an iron, into an iron radiation and see what happens. Can we then try to achieve the same results that have been lacking in the past? Um, we're going to use the same test to compare. Neutron, previously only vicus hardness, the iron radiated it's only been nano indentation. There's obviously some differences there that we need to account for. And then we're going to use, build up this understanding of the microstructural changes and feed that in to the end mechanical properties to make sure we understand what's occurring there.
Finally, multiple dose rates. This has been done on some iron chrome and would be critical for feeding into um, understanding what the differences are between an and neutron. It has been shown that it has some difference on precipitate formation and that could explain that critical difference between the an and neutron irradiation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much.